Turn with me to the Old Testament to the book of 2 Kings, chapter 2. 2 Kings, chapter 2. Just reading two verses of Scripture tonight. 2 Kings, chapter 2, beginning in verse number 9. And it came to pass when they, speaking of Elijah and Elisha, were gone over that Elijah said unto Elisha, Ask what I shall do for you before I be taken away from you. And Elisha said, I pray you, let a double portion of your spirit be upon me. And he said, you have asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if you see me when I'm taken from you, it shall be so unto you. And I'm going to stop right there. And I want to use for a subject, ministering just for a few moments tonight, I'm staking my claim. I'm staking my claim. It may be hard, it may be impossible, but nothing is impossible with God. I'm staking my claim tonight, and I pray that you do the same thing. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus. We're so grateful and thankful for your anointing upon us. And Lord, I'm asking that you would touch us. Anoint us to minister in this service tonight. And we ask that you would anoint our ears to hear what you would have us say. We ask it all in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. And everyone said, Amen and Amen. Amen. Seeing that it is Memorial Day tomorrow, I want to start off this message with a story. It really has nothing to do with the message in general, but it was a personal happening, a personal event. It really left a mark on me. I guess I was about 21, 22 years of age, and Dad had the opportunity, this was about 12 years ago, something like that, had the opportunity to minister in Paris, France. We had been there several times, but This was my first time traveling with him to this particular church that he was ministering at. Pretty large church there in Paris. We went a couple of days early, and one of the reasons why that we went, and we didn't really know it, I guess, at the time until we got there, but Dad suggested and asked, he said, how would you like to take a tour of some of the different sites, the battle sites of World War II? And I said, sure, I would love to do that. I'm not a history person, a history buff, just like Dad and Papa, but I do like history. I like it better than any other subject outside, of course, of the Word of God. We went, we got up early that morning, and it was an all-day affair. We hit some of the strategic points where the Allied forces would hold off the Axis forces. If they would not have done that, more than likely certain parts of France would have fallen. Certain parts of Europe would have fallen. But the highlight to me of the trip, and it was the first time that I had ever been there, was Normandy. They took us down to the beaches, and you can still see the fortifications that were built by the Germans right there on the beach. As thousands of young men gave their lives in regards to the Allied forces, it was a moving experience. But what made it so personal and real to me was seeing those thousands upon thousands of white crosses. I stood there, and of course, you can see veterans who had been there, who had known some of the people that had fallen the comrades that had fallen that day or during some time during the war. I stood there speechless, not really knowing what to say or what to do. It's an awe-inspiring sight. And as tears would begin to well up in my eyes, the first thing that came to mind was I thank God for our men and women and in the armed forces. I thank God, and as Robin and I have stated many times before, before during our shift, when we have a veteran that would call in, we salute them. They are 
a hero. Yes, they are. No, you didn't get that. They are our heroes. They are our heroes. And they deserve the respect given to them. But what made this surreal was seeing these thousands of crosses. I just happened to walk toward one. I walked around to see the name of the individual. And this is what shocked me. Was out of all those thousands of crosses that I could have come across that day, the first one that I came across was a young man that died June 6, 1944, that day from Baton Rouge. What are the odds? But at the same time, as I look down, I don't know who that individual was. I don't know his family. don't know anything about him. But I do know this, that he gave his life to preserve my freedoms that I've experienced today. And our men and women in armed forces, if you're watching, we salute you. We love you. We pray for you daily. And we can't wait for you to get back on American soil. Amen. Let's give it. Let's give them a round of applause. There was never two prophets like Elijah and Elisha. You want to talk about some of the most outstanding miracles that were performed. Look no further outside of Jesus Christ than Elijah and Elisha. Phenomenal miracles. Elisha was plowing a field when Elijah found him. When Elijah, instructed by the Holy Spirit, when he looked over and saw this young man plowing a field, he told him, that's the one, that's going to be your successor. And it was at that moment that he would take his mantle and cast it upon and put it upon Elisha. But before I go any further, I want to say this, that there were a school of prophets. I should say there was a school of prophets that was nearby. But God did not tell Elijah to go to the school of prophets to find his successor. But he found him in a field. Sometimes men may look at you and don't see much. But when God looks at you, he sees something totally different. Because God doesn't care about the degrees behind your name. He cares about what's in your heart. He doesn't care with the piece of paper that you've got hanging on your wall. He he, he wants your heart. He, He looks at your heart. He desires your heart. You think about that. He didn't choose one from the school of prophets, but he chose a plowboy, a plowboy, and called him to be the successor of Elijah. Elijah, whose name means God is Jehovah, is a type of the law. But Elisha, whose name means God is my salvation, is a type of grace. And let me tell you, As you know this, however many miracles that Elijah performed, Elisha performed double the amount of miracles, which lets us know, and I'll get to that in a moment, but it lets us know that it's so much far better being in grace than it is being under law. That's right. That's right, Gabe. Amen. It's so much better being under grace for where sin abounded. Grace much more abounded. And grace, the grace that is given and has been given is because of the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I was teaching on on this, the subject of grace and cross for our last Wednesday night, and I want to say this. There was just enough grace under the old covenant as it is under the new covenant. The only difference is the cross. Are you here tonight? 
there was just as much grace under the old covenant because God is a God of grace. Yes, he is. As it is under the new covenant, the only difference is the cross. Everything hinge, hinges upon the cross. Everything. Not just 99% or 50%, but every single thing hinges upon Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Our salvation is hinged upon the cross. Our healing is hinged upon the cross. Our deliverance is hinged upon the cross. Our blessings are hinged upon the cross. The baptism with the Holy Spirit is hinged upon the cross. My life is hinged upon the cross. My ministry is hinged upon the cross. And guess what? The youth ministry that God's given me is hinged upon the cross. My Lord, everything I am is hinged upon the cross. I said everything that I am is hinged upon the cross. Somebody get this tonight. I feel this. Everything that I am is hinged on Jesus Christ and him crucified. Glory to God. Everything. Everything, everything is hinged on the blood of Jesus Christ. Did you realize that the blood of Jesus Christ is the strength of the church and the Holy Spirit is the power of the church? Oh, my Lord. That's what we got to get back to. The blood of Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit. Oh, let me, let, let, let me, I'm, I'm going to just, I'm going to blow your mind for a second. It wasn't by coincidence, some 30 years ago, I guess it was, that dad had the privilege of coming across the name and helping the name Crossfire. You didn't know that, did you? But it wasn't by coincidence that we came upon that name. Because God knew sometime in the future, a young man would be raised up to preach not only Jesus Christ and him crucified, but preach the power of the Holy Ghost. Cross, fire, cross, fire. Without the cross, you can't have the fire. My Lord. feel that you're gonna have to forgive me for a second because I'm gonna shout over that just for a moment thank God for the cross thank God for the fire thank God for the cross thank God for the fire thank God thank God that we don't sit here and for our young people entertain them but we give them something that will last for time and for eternity. Because when you preach the cross under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, you're going to see some young people's lives changed. You're going to see some adults' lives changed. You're going to see some churches changed. You're going to see some cities changed. You're going to see some countries changed. And you can see a world change when you start preaching the cross under the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. That's good stuff. The cross and the fire. That's why I'm proud that I'm a part of cross fire mm. cross fire now just had to throw that in there now everything is hinged upon the cross the grace of God is made possible by Jesus Christ and what he did at Calvary Amen. and it's the cross of Christ that gives 
the Holy Spirit the ability to flow and to provide grace to the believer on a never-ending basis. That means every single moment of every single day, you can have the grace of God flowing in your life as long as you look to Jesus Christ and what he did at Calvary. Everything is hinged upon grace. Now, for 10 years, 10 years, Elisha was under the tutelage of Elijah. And here were the last, it was the last test before God would bring Elijah up to heaven in a chariot of fire. He tells Elisha, stay here at Gilgal. God has called me on to Bethel. And you see, I don't know how he knew, but somehow he knew, Elisha knew that Elijah was about to be taken. He knew it. And he told Elijah, "Uh uh-uh, I'm not staying here, but wherever you go, I'm not leaving your side. I'm not letting you out of my sight. Now listen, Gilgal means what? Rolled away. It was the beginning of the conquest of the children of Israel over the enemies of God in the land of promise. Every one of us has a Gilgal, our beginning, where our sins were rolled away. Oh, did you get that? That means that no matter when you got saved, if it was yesterday, this morning, last week, last year, 25 years ago, you had a beginning experience. You had a Gilgal experience where your sins were rolled away. I'll be 35 in September. Almost 30 years ago, in my bedroom, I had my Gilgal experience where my sins were rolled away, where it was the beginning of my spiritual life. You have a birthday, mine September 19th. That's my natural birthday, but I also have a spiritual birthday. I don't remember the date, but I know it was there. It was nearly 30 years ago on a Sunday night in my bedroom when I said yes to Jesus, that was my birthday. That was my spiritual birthday. And whenever you got saved, no matter when it was, that was your spiritual birthday. It was your beginning of a brand new life. The beginning of a new life. He says, I'm going to go on to Bethel. Stay here. He says, "Uh uh-uh, not going to do that. They arrive into Bethel, which means house of God. See the progression? You have your beginning. And God takes you from your beginning and brings you into the house of God. Thank God he doesn't leave us back there on a wilderness somewhere. But he brings us into the house of God. Then he tells Elisha, stay here. I'm going to go on to Jericho. He says, "Uh uh-uh. I'm going with you to Jericho. Jericho was the place, it was the fortification, the last place that, 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 that stood in the way of the children of Israel entering into the promised land. A fortress that stood tall. But God told Joshua, march around that city. And on the seventh day, Take seven priests with seven ram's horns and walk around that city seven times. And on the seventh time, the moment that you finish, take those ram's horns and blow it and watch what happens. And on that seventh time, when they marched around Jericho and they blew those trumpets, a mighty hand... I said a mighty hand came down from heaven and took... The walls didn't just crumble, but God pushed them down. 
His mighty hand pushed down those Jericho walls and spread them out. Jericho talks of victory. You have your beginning. You go to the house of God, but he doesn't leave you there. He wants to bring you into victory over the world, the flesh, and the devil. Victorious over every problem. Victorious over every sin in your life. All right. That's good. That's where I want to be. And guess what? Because of Jesus Christ and my place in Christ, I am more than an overcomer. I am more than a conqueror because I'm in Christ and he's in me. Hallelujah. Now, thank you. I was, Brian and I last uh, month were in Georgia. You never know, man. You got some people that whenever they get happy, they say some pretty crazy things. I'm sitting there preaching, and all of a sudden, I heard somebody say, now you're shucking the corn. I said, wow. I thought to myself, I, I, now, and then another one was said, now you're plowing. Okay. Then I had one time in California, got to preaching, and a power of God was moving and a brother stands up on the, I mean he got happy he took out his wallet took out a $50 bill and placed it right on the podium I looked at it and I went on he saw it was standing there he got up and went and took it back and put it back in his pocket I'm still waiting on that $50 now that's man thought I was doing good till he took it back Some people, they come to the Jordan, and Elijah takes his mantle off, strikes the Jordan River, and it parts. They cross over onto the other side, and Elijah asks Elijah, or Elisha, a question. Ask what I shall do for you. Don't you know that God's asking you the same question? What do you want me to do for you? Mm, My Lord, my Lord, God's asking you the same question. What do you want me to do for you? What do you want me to do for you? What do you, are you getting this? He's just asking you, what do you want? Not what do you need. What do you want? What do you want? Ask me what I shall do for you. What a question. You see, some people, whenever they ask this question, the first thing that, it, that, that comes into their mind is something temporal. I want money, Hmm. fame, popularity. I want power. But you see, Elisha did not think of anything that was temporal. He asked for something that was impossible. He asked for something that was spiritual. His mind was only concerned with that which is of the spirit and not which is that of that, that is of the temporal he didn't care anything about anything being temporal he wanted a, he wanted that something from god He wanted something from the Lord. No matter what it was, I want something from God. Okay, that's weak. Let's get into it. What do you want? And his answer is, I want a double portion. I want a double portion of your spirit. I want a double portion. I said, I want a double portion. In other words, I know I said this a few weeks ago, but even from then until now, it's been in my spirit. Elisha it was asking for something that was in the natural impossible. God wants you to ask him for the impossible. 
Don't ask him for that which is possible. But ask him for something and that which is impossible. Why? Because you serve a God of the impossibilities. No matter what it is, if it's impossible, my God's able to do it. If it's impossible, my God is able to perform the impossible. With God. I said with God. All things are Oh, come on, church. Say it like you mean it. With God, all things are. Come on, church. Say it like you feel it. With God, all things are. One more time. Tell the devil, devil, with my God, all things are. Quit settling. Quit settling. We got too many Christians that are settling are not asking anything. You have not because you. I'm asking God, not just for a little sliver, but I'm asking him for that which is impossible. I'm asking, that means this. It means if your kids are living like the devil himself and everyone tells you it's no use, let them go with God. I said with God, with God, with God, with God, with God, with God, God. not with man, not with Buddha, but with God, all things are possible. He asks for something that which is impossible. It was impossible. Elijah did not have it to give it to him. Let me help you. Don't come up to me and get me to put my hand on your head and say, give me your anointing. I don't have it to give it because it's not mine to begin with. It belongs to him. Jesus said, for the spirit of the Lord is upon me. And he has anointed me. 1 Corinthians 12 tells us that it's the spirit who disperses that whom he chooses and what he chooses to whom he chooses. So nobody can impart anything unto you. The only one that can is Jesus. The only one that can is Jesus Christ. He can give you what you need. So quit asking man for something and start asking God. Start believing God. Start seeking God for that which is impossible. Hmm. Ask him for that which is impossible impossible doctor said it's no use well they're a man but i know the man i know the great physician i know the great doctor I know the one who can perform surgery without even touching you. I know someone that can shriek up cancer without anybody doing anything to you. I serve a God that specializes in the impossibilities. So ask him for that which is impossible. Do you realize you serve a big God? You you, You hear it? A million times throughout a year at this place. God is a big God. So ask big. Don't settle. But ask big. Ask big. Ask big. Believe big. Mm-mm-mm. Are you getting this tonight? I'm getting this. This is in my spirit. I'm asking God for some things that are impossible to man. But guess what? I don't serve man. And when man says you can't, God says you can. Because if it's in the will of God, it shall come to pass. If it's the will of God. Now, he said, I'm asking for a double portion. Let me say this right quick for a moment. 
another personal story. About 16 years of age, I guess, 16, 15, 16. It's a camp meeting service. I don't remember who preached that night. I, I really, to be honest, don't remember. Probably Papa, I guess, or maybe Dad, but I don't even remember what the subject matter was. I don't remember anything, anything about the service except the altar call. I was sitting right over there. When I was a teenager at about 15, I would always sit stage left, always. I would sit close to where, close in the back. And that service, the Spirit of God was moving in the altar service. And I don't even know if Dad remembers this or not, but I do because it's framed in my mind. He was standing over here where he normally does, where he's sitting right now. During the altar call, he got up and walked around the monitor board and exited on that side where that rope is right over there. And he finds me and my younger brother, Matthew, and he motions to us. And like good kids, we went. <laughs> Begrudgingly, though, we did go. But he put his arms. I was on his right. Matthew was on his left. And the moment he grabbed us, I felt the presence of God. And he began to weep. And the Spirit of God just to begin to speak through him. And he was speaking with other tongues. And I was sitting there. And I, as a teenager, I would always try to hold back my emotions. So no one would see if I'm crying or whatever. But tears are welling up on the inside of my eyeballs. And I'm doing everything I can to stop them. Without even looking up. He just spoke. He said, Gabriel, the same anointing that's on your grandfather and on your father is on you. God. And when I said that, it hit me. I, I mean, I still remember it to this day. And from that moment, and whenever I, I think about that in preparing this message, that came to my mind. Because there have been times whenever that in my prayer time that that would come up and I would begin to ask God, Lord, I want a double portion of your spirit. I want a double portion of your anointing. They can't give it to me, but I know you can. And I'm asking for a double portion. And let me tell you something. This is for this ministry. We're asking for a double portion of his anointing upon this ministry to touch this world one more time. And guess what? What we had back then, we're going to see double right now. What we had back then, we're going to see double in the, next, in the next few months, the next few years. Every city, every town, every village, every state, every country, guess what? We are going to get double. I'm believing God for double. That means this, devil, I'm taking back everything that you have stolen from us. I'm taking it back. We're taking back every city, every town, every village, every nation. And guess what? Devil, there ain't a thing that you can do about it. Woo! Double. 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 I believe in God for double. More than before. And guess what? God always saves the best for last. He always saves the best for the last. I'm asking him for great and mighty things. And you see, when he said this, Elisha, what a statement. What, what's, what, what a request to ask for. A double portion. And Elijah responds. He says this, you have asked... A hard thing. That word hard in the Hebrew means you have staked a great claim. Mm -mm. You have staked. It's not just asking for a hard thing. But he said you have staked a great claim. 
and I want to serve notice on the devil, I'm staking my claim tonight. I'm staking my claim tonight. I'm staking my claim for this network. I'm staking my claim for my youth ministry. I'm staking my claim that God's going to give us everything that Satan has taken from us. Let me tell you something. I'm staking. You have to do the same thing. Don't just go off of what we say. You do it for yourself. You stake God. You stake a great claim for whatever it is that is before you. It may be a hard thing. But it goes back to asking for the impossible. My Bible tells me, if thou canst believe that all things are possible. Not some things. But tonight, let me tell you, I'm staking my claim that he's going to give us a double portion of his spirit to touch this world. Let me tell you, Russia, we're coming your way. We're already there. But guess what? God is getting ready to open up those doors wide in a way that we've never seen before. Guess what? This world, it's coming. It's coming. It's coming. It's coming. It's coming. I'm staking my claim tonight. That everything that Satan has taken, God will give it back to us. And some on top of that. Oh, you didn't get that. Not only is God going to give us back what Satan stole, but he's going to give us that on top of that. He's going to give us double, 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 double. I'm staking my claim tonight. My question is, are you? Are you staking your claim? Make it personal. Whatever it is that is on your heart, whatever it is that you've been seeking the Lord for, start saying, I'm staking my claim. I'm asking God for the impossible. I'm staking my claim right now. I'm staking my claim for my kids, my husband, my wife, my children, my job, my whatever. I'm staking my claim. And I'm staking my claim. Singers, musicians, make your way back. I told you I was going to be done early. I'm staking my claim. Because God is not through with us yet. The world has written us off. And the church has written us off. But I got news for the church. God's going to finish what he started. I said, God's going to finish just what he started. I said, God's going to finish just what he started. There's going to come a day and there's going to come a moment in time whenever somebody's going to be riding down Blue Bonnet Boulevard. God is not on their mind, but they're going to find themselves turning their steering wheel into 8919 World Ministry Avenue, wondering what in the world am I doing here at Swaggers? I know that I, don't, I should not be here. I came by and all of a sudden when they put that car in the park and opened that door, the moment they put that foot on the concrete, the power of God is going to get a hold of their life. Save them. They're going to come too. They're going to have a joyous experience. But that's just the beginning because as they find themselves walking, and opening up the door of that of the lobby. And the moment their foot hits the carpet of the lobby, yes. the power of God is going to baptize them with the Holy Ghost, with the evidence of speaking with other tongues. And I'm going to say this. The days of miracles and the days of healing are not over. You didn't, you didn't hear me. The days of healing are not over. The days of miracle are not over because they're going to be somebody that's going to turn on that television set. Sitting in a wheelchair, bound and sick and oppressed. And all of a sudden, when they come across SBN, it's going to happen. A, they're going to sit there and say, I felt a ball of oil hit the top of my head and flow out to the soles of my feet and say, I can't explain it, but I'm healed. I'm healed. I'm healed. 
I'm asking God for a double portion. What we saw back then, we're going to see it double now. I'm staking my claim tonight. Are you? I said, are you? Are you staking your claim? I'm staking my claim. Stand to your feet right now. I know my Lord's going to lead me out. It's time to start staking my great claim. No matter where you may be, stake your claim tonight. Stake your claim tonight. Put your hands up in the air right now. Start believing God. I'm staking my claim right now. Whatever it is, I'm staking my claim. God's going to do it. He's going to do it. He's going to do it again. Start claiming it. If you need blessing, start claiming it. In the name of Jesus, I'm staking my great claim tonight. I'm believing God for the impossible. I'm believing God for that which is impossible. Thank you, Jesus. No, my Lord's going to lead me out. Come on, put your hands together. Let's sing it right now. 